Now we are back in America, where Remy is about to share a cookie with Ashley Gearhart, clinical psychologist at the University of Michigan. Actually, I thought since we were talking ah. about addictions and chocolate uh -huh. and, and sugar and fat, I thought we'd, we'd have a little bit of these. These are some perfect examples <laughs> right there. She studies the relationship between food and addiction. I'm personally pretty addicted to chocolate, to sugar, and things like that. Yeah. And um, I'm, you know, this is, I wanted to talk about that. What yeah. is an addiction, a food addiction? So, um, for example, if you're going to take a coca leaf, and you're going to sip it in a tea or chew it, mm. you know, it really has very little addictive potential. People don't really get addicted to that. But if you take it into a lab and you strip it down so it's much more potent, and then you increase it so it really hits your blood and your brain really, really fast, you have cocaine, and it becomes much more addictive. So if you think of what we've done with our food in the last couple decades, we've taken things like sugar and fat and salt that are already really rewarding, and we've stripped them from their natural containers, and we've increased the amounts that are in foods like this. And so now these have such high amounts of sugar and fat and salt, more than our bodies have ever been able to kind of man manage before. Mm -hmm. And so they really kind of spike your spike your brain get it go really going when you have that first bite of chocolate have some chocolate ah uh, yes a little bit of chocolate see yeah. that one's got salt you see oh this one has so salt that's, on it okay. yeah so that's like the perfect trifecta of the sugar and the fat and the salt if fat sugar and salt tickle our pleasure centers can we actually say that these substances behave like drugs In 2008, during the course of an experiment, a research team based in Bordeaux accidentally stumbled upon something unexpected. We were not initially interested in sugar. Our primary objective was to understand the neurobiology behind the cocaine addiction. In order to do this, we decided for the first time to offer the animals a choice between cocaine received intravenously, which are highly addictive means of intake, and a reward option that would be naturally ingested. And we chose a sugary beverage as the reward option. To our surprise, practically all the animals shied away from the cocaine in order to drink more and more sugar. So when man savors sugar, is it having a drug-like effect on him? Scientists at the University of Oregon have decided to find out using brain imagery. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Are you ready for yeah, a little Yeah, I'm right. Well, I'm a little scared, a little okay. apprehensive. Yeah, everyone is a little bit nervous <laughs> in the beginning, but... Uh... Remy is about to undergo an MRI while drinking a chocolate milkshake. It makes you kind of anxious and nervous the first time. So I'm going to place the manifold right now in front of your mouth, and I would like you to open your mouth right now. How is that for you? Yeah, you can embrace it right now. Yeah, fine. Okay. Positioning um, test here. Oh my god. Sonia Yoakum, MRI specialist, will be today's waitress. Yeah, and it's only a... All right. Are you ready? Yeah. Just do your best. Okay, I'll do my best. All right, here we go. Okay. After 45 minutes of testing, the zones of the brain that have been activated by sugar begin to appear on the screen. Okay, well, let's move on. Let's see what happens. I want to see if I'm a real addict here. <laughs> <laughs> so let's show the images where um, you actually received oh, wow. the, uh, like the milkshake. Am I lighting up? <laughs> uh, yes, you definitely light up. Um, there are some areas that we know that light up during when you receive uh, very palatable food, very mm -hmm. like tasty food. So here we definitely see caudate activation, right. big reward area. Um, yeah, I was excited about it. I, yeah, I yeah, enjoyed totally. that. I it's liked it a lot. It's rewarding. Yeah. 
So basically you're saying I'm an addict, right? No, I'm not at all. <laughs> no, I mean, I can compare your brain image with someone that um, uh, is, a real, is a real food okay. addict. And yeah. so there's a big difference. Okay. This is you. Uh-huh. And this oh, is... It's like an explosion of... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's all over. So it's a big difference. <laughs> Like you, she also shows yeah. reward activation, but it's much bigger. But There's spread a lot out. more okay. activation. It's impressive. But you, when you say food addiction, you say to you that exists. It definitely exists, yeah. With brain imaging, you can't really hide it. I yeah. mean, if someone gets a chocolate milkshake, your brain just lights up. Yeah. So it's a, a lot more objective mm -hmm. compared to a questionnaire, for example. If sugar activates the brain's reward zones just like a drug, then it stands to reason that one could develop an addiction to sugar. First you consume a bit of the substance, then you abuse the substance, and one day you can't live without it. get together in support groups. This eating disorder group is called Overeaters Anonymous. Hi, I'm Marie, former compulsive eater. I'm new to the program, but I've been abstaining for 41 days. I eat three balanced, moderately sized meals, and I don't eat in between. It isn't always easy, but it is a new life for me. Lots of emotions rise to the surface and lots of sadness because I think that food calmed me down quite a bit. The snacking calmed me down. Today I've eliminated all that and I have had to accept to go through some tough times. Sometimes I miss food, certain foods, I obsess about sweets. What I wanted to say is that I can't stay clean. I eat even if I'm not hungry, just because it's in front of me, because I can, because someone in a shop offers me a taste. And I get such pleasure out of it. This may sound incredible, but I prefer eating to sex. People say to me, eat an apple. I'm sorry, but I have absolutely no desire to eat an apple. I want a sugar high. I want something that gives me a boost because I can't live without it. Thanks for listening. If we can all potentially become addicted to food, how should we feel about the manufacturers of all this processed food? It's time for an appointment with the French addiction specialist, Dr. William Lowenstein. The goal of those who work in the food industry is to sell, not to save humanity. Of course. This industry has figured out exactly what pushes us to go from moderate consumption to abuse, and finally, to addiction. Yes, there are certain substances that we can wonder about from this perspective, such as sugar, salt, fatty acids. Those substances that are more addictive than others. These industrials, just like drug dealers, need to develop customer loyalty. So yes, they focus on salt, sugar, fatty acids, even colors to hook their customers who we see is patients. Do food manufacturers know that sugar is addictive? Are they junk food dealers? Do they scheme to push us to buy more and more of their products? Remy would have liked to have asked them directly, but none of them accepted his request for a meeting. However, due to alternative communications priorities, unfortunately, we will not be able to grant your request for a filmed interview. 
Nestlé, but also Kraft, Unilever and Danone, each group would rather refrain from commenting. What the hell are they hiding? This silence is not only appalling, more importantly, it is harmful to us. Because this is a public health issue we're talking about. Point four billion human beings are overweight. That number is higher than world hunger. There are now five million obese people walking this planet, a figure that has doubled over one generation. These excess pounds are the cause of many illnesses, such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease. The problem is so serious and widespread that the United Nations has begun to get involved. In Geneva, at the United Nations Human Rights Council, Remy is meeting with Olivier de Schutter, United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. Mr. de Schutter's job is to make countries aware of this public health issue. Your Excellency, today I'm calling upon each nation's sense of responsibility. We can no longer allow ourselves to be satisfied by the food industry's empty declarations. A systemic problem requires systemic solutions. But the solutions are slow in coming. Our goal is to mobilize governments on this issue. I believe that no government will act until public opinion expresses impatience and protests against the lack of governmental action in fighting this plague to modern society. Diabetes, cancer and cardiovascular disease weigh heavily on national budgets, particularly in light of the increasing number of victims of these illnesses. My role is to counteract the pressure exerted by the food industry to maintain the status quo. The fight against obesity and excess weight must become a political issue, just like climate change did a few years back. What policy should be implemented to fight against obesity? Governments are slow to impose regulations on the industry. Simple and efficient systems to inform consumers do in fact exist, but the food industry refuses to set them up. Hi, Remy Burkle. Moni Goyen, nice to meet you. Welcome to the book. Monique Goyen, Director General of the European Consumers Union, has been fighting to get Brussels to require traffic light symbols on all food packaging. Monique, can you explain the traffic light idea to us, please? It works like traffic lights in the street. A red light means stop, this contains lots of sugar. The green light means this is okay to eat. And the orange light indicates that the product has a high fat content. Unfortunately, the system applied by the European legislator is not this one. He implemented a much more complicated one that is difficult to understand for the consumer and not very visible on the packaging. But why did the Euro deputies vote against your proposed system? They were under an enormous amount of pressure from the food industry. An armada of consultants invaded the European Parliament. The issue was over-lobbied. Certain Euro deputies even complained. There was huge pressure and threats of job cuts and delocalization were used as leverage. Some say that 1 billion euros was spent on counter-research to block the adoption of a traffic light warning system, whereas Whereas this is the one that would orient the consumer towards healthier food options. I thought this system was in use elsewhere. Yes, it is used voluntarily in Germany and it exists in Spain and Portugal. So all in all, certain supermarkets that value their customers consider this warning system useful and have decided to adopt it on their own. So why isn't it applied throughout Europe? Yes, why is that? Do you have the answer? I think that the food industry is afraid of change. It is scared that a system will be forced upon it and that the consumer will begin to understand what he is eating. 